Welcome to the show discussing problems and issues of health with Dr. Alcena. For this segment of the show, I'm going to talk about a condition called pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is extremely common, more common than people realize. I took this chapter, chapter 108, from this very big book that I wrote, The Art and Practice of Modern Clinical Medicine in 2017. Okay, so chapter 108 is from and having to do with pulmonary embolism. Let me give you the statistic, they're very sobering. Every year, 600,000 individuals in this country develop pulmonary emboli, embolism, resulting in about 300,000 deaths per year. In addition to that, 60,000 people every year die of undiagnosed pulmonary embolism. Very, very common problem. You ask, well, what is a pulmonary embolus? Pulmonary embolus is a clot that's developed somewhere in the, what we call the low flow system or the venous system and somehow get dislodged and get carried by the bloodstream into the lung. Very, very serious problem. The most serious part of pulmonary embolism is something called a saddle embolus. Saddle embolus is when a clot dislodges from somewhere in the venous system. The blood flow rushes it to the lungs area and it finds its way in between the circulation of the, the connection of the left lung and the right lung, right there. If it sits right there, the patient dies in a millisecond, just like that, drop and die, because that's what the saddle embolism will do. It cut off the respiratory flow, and then person it dropped there, just like that. Fortunately, saddle embolism does not occur very often, but it can occur. Now you say, well, where does this embolus come from? I have 16 things as a list here I'm going to read to you that can predispose someone to the development of a pulmonary embolus, obesity, birth control pill, hormone replacement therapy, post-surgery immobilization, multiple trauma, immobilization after a stroke, hypercoagulable state due to different types of what I've been talking about earlier called thrombophilias. That is blood abnormalities that find themselves, either you were born with the abnormality or you acquired the abnormality. And the list, as I've been talking to you the last several shows, is quite long. And the person, of course, develop a deep vein thrombophlebitis as a result of having had any one of those thrombophilias and or possibly Trousseau syndrome. And then the person dislodges the clot, get carried to the lung, and bingo, you have a clot in the lung. A hundred percent of the time, the clot that is found in the lung comes from a red thrombus. Remember we have white thrombus, we have a red thrombus. You say, but Val, what are you talking about? The thing looks red. Yeah, but inside of it, a red thrombus is made up mainly of red blood cell and debris with very, very few platelets. The white thrombus, on the other hand, is developed in the arterial system or the high flow system. And the white thrombus is made up mainly of white blood cell, platelet, and a few debris. Very crucial. Remember, underline the word platelet. When I talk about treatment, you will see how important it is that one understands the difference between red thrombus and white thrombus. The causation, number one, are different. And the evaluations are different, the symptoms are different, 
and of course the treatments are different. Anybody who tells you that a thrombus that is developed in a low flow system, namely the venous system, can be treated with aspirin or aspirin containing medication, they frankly don't know what they're talking about. Run away from this individual as fast and quick as you can for your own benefit. They don't know what they're talking about. And they, what is sad about it, the concept of red thrombus and white thrombus is one of the oldest concepts in the field of medicine ever. One of the oldest concepts. This stuff is hundreds of years old. And yet, to this day, people still don't understand it. I find that hard to believe. What are these people doing? What it is that they're involved in, that they don't know the difference? I didn't create red thrombus concept. I didn't create white thrombus concept. I learned it. And when you check on it, the concept was discovered by the all the physicians that were extremely unsophisticated, there was no computer, there was no CAT scan, there was no MRI, there was no cell phone, hundreds of years ago. And yet, to this day, some of the modern physicians, whose people's lives are placed in their hands every second of every day, don't understand this concept, or they refuse to understand it. And nowadays, this stuff is so easily available. All you have to do is go on Google and Google this stupid thing, and you could find it right there. I'm teaching my students, some of the brightest, smartest, high IQ individual that God has created. I've had this incredible privilege of having to teach some of them. When I say something to them, within a matter of second, they can verify what I'm talking about <laughs> is true or false because the cell phone is there. You, you can't make this up, okay? To continue talking about the list, a condition called polycythemia vera can cause also is a predisposition. Postpartum state. Right now we're in the middle of major discussions in this country and well we should be. Why is it that so many women are dying in this developed country, the United States of America, after they give birth. Of all the developed countries in the world, more women die after giving birth in the United States than any other developed country. Because the conditions, and of course, among the women who are dying, minority women in particular, Negro women are dying more than any other women because of lack of appropriate and proper medical care. You can't make this up. People, these women die while giving birth. And they never had a chance to hug the little baby they just gave birth to because they die because they have conditions such as hypercoagulable blood loaded with thrombophilias that they knew nothing about before. Nobody ever told them when they're carrying the baby. And as you're carrying the baby, you must by necessity secrete tremendous amount of estrogen in order for the baby to grow properly, to maintain the birth. Well, one of the number one hormone that can cause somebody to clot when you have a thrombophilia is estrogen. How about that? So they are at risk right there. On top of that, many of them had bleeding abnormalities that nobody ever diagnosed, and they get pregnant. They were never evaluated for it. 25% of women who are having heavy menstrual bleeding during the menstrual period have a condition called von Willebrand disease. And 70 million people across the world suffer from von Willebrand, men and women. In this country, some 
two to 3.5 million individuals have an inveluble heart disease. And people give aspirin like it is candies. You give them aspirin for whatever reason. You show up in the emergency room, before you sneeze, you get somebody handed you two aspirin. Without, there's no, it's not the standard of practice to check people in this country for for Van Willebrand disease before you took them to the OR. And then when they get into the OR, they started bleeding, the surgery is over, and then the anesthesiologist doing the job to not suppress the patient's respiratory system, which is still under the control, they try not to use narcotics. One can understand that. And what do they give them? They give them Toradol to kill the pain. Well, what is Toradol? It is an NSAID, and it is contraindicated an individual who have Van Willebrand disease. How about that? I recall vividly, vividly, a scary situation whereby one of my patients was referred, young man, 35 years old, one of the youngest person I've ever diagnosed with colon cancer. And this individual was referred to a hospital, excellent hospital right here on Davis Avenue, for, for have surgery. Patient underwent the surgery, was in the recovery room, I mean, was in the, actually in the ICU, post-op. I had nothing to do with it. I had a house across the bridge in Walkland. And this man started bleeding like crazy. Starting, his blood pressure started to drop. They were about to rush him back to the emergency room. If they did that, he would not have survived. And I got a phone call from the patient's wife. She said, Dr. Alcina, in the middle of the night, my husband is about to die. I said, what are you talking about? His blood, he just dropped his blood pressure. He's bleeding profusely. I said, holy mackerel. I jump into the car. I'm just like a jet plane. I flew, literally flew across the bridge and got over here. As soon as I got there, I said, well, wait a minute, don't touch him. Do not take him to the OR. I know what's going on. Review. He was given Toradol. Post-op. You can't make this up. And all I had to do, ladies and gentlemen, was to say, back off. Give me one second, please. I back off, took on my pen, order a medication called DDAVP. Give this man a dose of DDAVP. Okay. You can't make this up. And a little bit of saline over a half hour, the bleeding stopped just like that. Because DDAVP will reverse the effect of the Torodol on his platelet. That's simple. There was no machine. It was just a brain power right there. And to this day, I got a f at least two or three phone calls from this man and his wife per year. This is like more than 30 something years later. Man survived his cancer, treated him for six months with chemo. You can't make this up. I'm getting two or three phone calls. Per Every Christmas I get a phone call. Every New Year I get a phone call. And to this day, the surgeon hit my guts. Hit. The surgeon had nothing to do with it. This was not the standard of practice. He didn't give the Torodol. The anesthesiologist gave it. He hated my gut to this day, and he will continue to hate my gut until the way he dies, because according to him, I made him feel bad. How did I make him feel bad? I walked in there to save my patients. You can't make this up. This is ugly stuff that I'm telling you. That's some of the nonsense I've had to deal with over the years. All I did was save my patient's life. By rushing in there, I quickly look at the chart. I saw the man had gotten to it. I said, oh my God, I know what's going on. Word on order, DDAVP, over half hour, bleeding stop, pressure goes back up. Never had to be taken to the OI again. Man left the hospital, came to my office. I had nurses in the office in those days. Gave him six months worth of five a few. That was the end of the story. The man survived, and to this day, some thirty some years later, this man and his wife are still calling, sending postcards. They're grateful that I saved his life, and the surgeon hit my gut because he claimed that I made him look bad. How? I have no idea. This is ugly stuff that I shouldn't be telling you, but I need you to know, doctors are human beings. 
the same nonsense that you're reading about every day, you saw on television every day, it's among doctors as well. We are human beings. We're doing our job. But some of us are just flat out ugly on the outside and ugly on the inside from the nonsense that I have to deal with. So continue with the list. As I said, if you have elevated homocysteine, that's a tumor failure. If your antitumor injury is decreased. Oh, by the way, let me finish the story about postpartum women. So that's one issue. I discussed the bleeding issue, the clotting issue. There's one more issue. Many of these women suffer from hypertension, which is a major problem during pregnancy for all women, but in particular, black women, because one of every Negro adult in this country suffers from hypertension. So when they are pregnant, even when they're not pregnant, most doctors don't know how to treat hypertension in Negroes. They just simply don't. They never learn it. They refuse to learn it because the bulk of the patients are not Negroes and they're treating blood pressure the same way they're treating the white patients and they're treating the Negro patients. And, it, and it, they couldn't be more wrong. Okay? So these women develop major, not minor, major uncontrolled blood problem pressure while they're pregnant. Not only is it a risk to the fetus, but it's also a risk to the mother. And then during the delivery, the pressure shoots sky high. These people have a bleeding stroke and they die just like that. So, so, so stroke, clotting, and other issues with bleeding, those are the, thing that are the three things that are killing these women more than any other women in the world, in this country. Isn't that shameful? United States of America, this highly developed country, and we're still losing all these mothers. We never get to see their babies. I lost my mother. She was 37 years old when she had a breech delivery. That's how my mother died. And she died when I was seven years old. Okay? And I don't know much about her because she took me away to a private fancy school. She was a very wealthy Jewish type woman, brilliant woman. And I was in a boarding school. I knew nothing about this. I mean, I mean, I knew something about her when I, I left home when I was five. So I lost my mother because she died during delivery. And the doctor, you can't make this up. The lady that was delivering the baby asked for help. The doctor showed up 12 hours later. By the time he showed up, he, saw, he found a dead body. My body exsanguinated to death. So I'm very sensitive to a whole lot of stuff, but you can imagine how sensitive I am to this issue. That's how I lost my mother. She was 37 years old. So this is serious business. She bled to death. OK. So as I just stated, all these conditions can predispose somebody to developing a pulmonary embolism. You ask then, what are the symptoms of pulmonary embolism? Well, shortness of breath, tachycardia, which is fast heart rate, Fluidic chest pain, severe chest pain, sweating, paleness, restlessness, coughing, coughing of blood, pain in the calf muscle, syncopal episode, and of course, sudden death. So therefore then, let us begin the evaluation of someone, and plus, let me say something to you. I just over the symptom with you. I just want you to know. Saw a patient yesterday for a follow-up. It was one of the two patients that I diagnosed with bilateral clots in the lung, both lung, a woman and a man, last year, with none of the symptoms that I just listed, zero, other than the fact that both of these patients had clots in the legs, and I decided, because of the other underlying issues, I needed to admit them to the hospital to treat the clot rather than treat it on the outside. That saved their lives. Because had I let them go home on medication by mouth, they would have died. How so? Well, I decided while I was writing the orders,
for this patient, this long list of others, I said to myself, well, I'll tell you what, why don't I do a CT angio, which is a test you could do like a special CAT scan. Both patients, did, I said the same to myself. They had no symptom, none of this list. All the only thing that was wrong with them, they had a clot and a little pain. And I decided to do the CT angio. Both patients last year, and the hospital right here on Davis Avenue had clot in both lungs with no symptom. Okay? So this is why I said this morning, while I was working on the floor, to the nurse in charge, you cannot practice. I don't care what anybody tell you, neither how smart you are, unless you have knowledge, experience, and judgment. You could have all the knowledge you want, but if you don't have the right judgment, Clinical judgment is an art form. You either have it or you don't have it. You have a lot of brilliant people in the field of medicine. They are in a laboratory doing research because they have zero clinical judgment. They can't do it. They just don't have that talent. And they realize it, so therefore they go and do research. So now let us evaluate someone then we take present to us. Somebody comes into the office or in the emergency room, complaining of chest pain, a bit of shortness of breath. Each time they take a deep breath, it hurts. And they're sweating all over the place. They hurt. The heart rate is very fast. They may even be febrile. So you have what's called a differential diagnosis. Are they having a heart attack? Do they have pneumonia because they have fever? Or do they have clots in the lung? Those are your three possibilities. So you examine the patient, you take the history, are you taking any birth control pill, are you taking any postmenopausal hormone, are you taking any hormone replacement from your urologist, or are you taking stuff over the counter to improve your sexual capabilities or whatever. You get that out of the way. Have you had cancer, what type of cancer it was, and so on. Then you take the vital sign, you examine the patient properly, then, of course, you will clearly order an EKG, order the chest X-ray, then you proceed to do some blood tests. Here's the key. You proceed to do some blood tests, okay? So you do a complete blood count, your complete chemistry profile, so far so good. You're going to do a PT, PTT on r and right, because the patient will be anticoagulated. You want to make sure that they have underlying abnormal coagulation issues. Guess what? Right there as you are doing the PT, PT, T, and R, you must remember to order a D-dimer because you can't have a clot anywhere in the body without your D-dimer becomes elevated. And it is a good thing to always put in your up whenever you're evaluating a patient for chest pain in the emergency room, please always order a D-dimer. Okay? So, then of course you're going to do an arterial blood gas because the patient is shortness of breath. She's, he or she is having difficulty processing oxygen through the lung. The patient may be hypoxic. So, that's where they, uh, you, did the, you, you go right ahead and get the blood gas out quickly. And then of course you're going to give the patient nasal oxygen because the patient has shortness of breath. You start that first. The patient needs to breathe. Patient shortness of breath, make sure you're getting a good IV in. Don't be pushing IV fluid into the patient because he or she already have a problem with the lungs. You don't want to overload the patient, but you got to have an IV line ready to go in case you got to intervene quickly. Put your IV line in, give the patient some oxygen, and then get a good analysis, get a whole bunch of other blood tests you want to do. Always proceed to do a hypercoagulable evaluation. If you don't know what they are, Call your hematology colleague, he or she will come and tell you what test to order. You order homocysteine, you order lipoprotein A, you go ahead and order protein S, protein C, antithrombin 3. Those are your basic stuff. If the patient from European origin, you order uh, factor 5 Leiden. Also, European origin, you order the and uh, uh, thrombo uh, the, the pro prothrombin profile, genetic profile thing. You do all this stuff, okay? But don't be fooled because I have diagnosed both factor 5 Leiden 
and proton men gene abnormalities and folks that had nothing to do with Europe or not even a, a choice of European ancestry. So be careful there. So you order all this stuff, okay? Then of course, as you're doing that, make sure you get yourself an ultrasound. It's very quick. The same way, it's the same time you send the picture for chest x-ray. Ask for an ultrasound of the lower extremities. Just because the patient doesn't have swelling on the leg doesn't mean he or she or he or she doesn't have a clot on the leg or in the groin somewhere. So you order the, a, an ultrasound of the lower extremity. You get all that stuff out of the way. Then your patient comes back to the emergency room and now you're ready to use judgment. Okay? Get yourself a CT angel. Okay? The CT angel will diagnose the big clot in the patient's lung or small clot or whatever for you. In the old days, we didn't have CT angio. We had a lung scan. They still have lung scan throughout the world because that's the easiest thing to do. It's a nuclear substance. Most hospitals across the world, no matter where they are, they're capable of doing lung scan. Not everybody has a CAT scan machine, but they certainly can do the lung scan, even though the lung scan takes a little longer to get back. But you don't even have to wait for the lung scan to come back. Clinical judgment can only tell you your patient is clotting somewhere. And based on the symptoms, that's got to be either a heart attack or and the EKG will help you there. The, uh, and all the other tests we do for cardiac evaluation will help you there to differentiate between a, the, between a lung scan I mean, between the pulmonary embolism problem versus an acute heart attack. You, you, you have to know how to do these things. And then you proceed to make a judgment to treat the patient quickly because you cannot wait for the result to come back. You could always cancel the treatment, but you have to save the life by beginning to anticoagulate the patient. Anticoag Once you got your PTPTT back, your platelet count back, you can go right ahead and start treating the patient either with heparin, or Levinox, do you want those, those two acute things? Those are the two acute medications you could use. Either Levinox or heparin quickly, based on the patient's carotid clearance, you heparinize the patient. And then once the patient is heparinized for several days, you prove the diagnosis, then the patient can always be switched over either to Coumadin, if it's appropriate, and or patient can go to one of those factor 10 inhibitors, so that's Zoralto, etc. And you take it from there. This is how you save somebody's life from dying as a result of pulmonary emboli. That's what you do, okay? And that's, this is the way it is. I'm going to stop here. And next week, I'll be doing a new series on something else. When there's such time, keep watching the show. This is Dr. Alcina saying so long and bye-bye.